be very tricky for Hungerford, very quiet at the moment. Again, some of the, a lot of the shops are closed, High Street's pretty quiet. So um, I'm hoping that um, some of the wise words said this evening, um, we'll be able to help some of the local community. Laura, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, appreciate it. it's an extremely busy time for you at the moment and with everything that's going on. Um, so if you could just give us a, a quick update, um, anything uh, interesting come along with uh, for the government um, with regard to helping local commerce and business. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, just checking I'm not on mute. I have this bad habit of kind of getting 30 seconds into whatever I'm saying and realizing that no one's heard a word. Um, so I think before I tell you what I think you can expect in terms of business support after we leave lockdown, it's probably important to give you a bit of context um, as to how we got here from, a, from the point of view of the Treasury. It certainly wasn't the Chancellor's expectation or ambition heading into the autumn that there would be another national lockdown. And I'm sure you're aware that everything that you would have seen from September onwards was focusing on getting people back into the workplace and footfall on the high street and kind of getting business places of all shapes and sizes and different you know workplaces up and running again and the decision to have the four-week lockdown during the month of November was reached quickly probably over about a five to seven day period so I don't think the Treasury I mean I, I know this actually because some Treasury officials gave evidence at the Treasury Select Committee this morning I don't think they had much time to do any kind of impact assessment on what that would mean for say hospitality and businesses that would have to close. What they did much like with the first lockdown is they put in place or they rather reinstated um, the financial support packages that we, we saw in March. So the furlough scheme, the self-employed income support scheme, business grants, which I hope by the way, anyone on this call um, is aware of and if you're not aware of it and you have a business that's been forced to close do raise your hand when I've completed this little presentation because I'll be happy to direct you uh, also loans uh, mortgage holidays that sort of package of support that you saw in the first half of this year has basically been reinvigorated and I think it's right to say that the Chancellor hasn't given the house any specific indication of what he'll be doing when we come out of the lockdown. However, I think there's some pretty clear clues as to what kind of support he's been, he's been going to, to kind of provide. Because you've seen the way that the Chancellor likes to operate the kind of financial levers to support businesses. And you've seen that really from about late July. So the Eat Out to Help Out scheme was not just a sort of you know, some people think it was just a consumer discount to encourage people to go and get a cheap pizza. Of course, it wasn't that. The purpose of the scheme was, yes, to entice the customer back, but it was also to sustain those jobs in hospitality, the hospitality industry, in principle, particularly because he, the Chancellor says this again and again. If you look at hospitality across the nation, a lot of the people who work in that sector um, are, are low paid, and also a lot of young people work in that sector. And so one of the reasons why he went for that tool is it sort of, it kind of addressed two issues, which was supporting low paid work and also supporting young people's work. You've all, in terms of young people, you, off, you also will be aware of the Kickstart scheme. And I know you're gonna hear more about that tonight, which I would imagine has sort of fallen rather flat because of the national lockdown, but that was a six month period from the 1st of November till the end of April when any young person between the ages of 16 and 24 could get a job with a qualifying employer and the government would essentially guarantee their wages, a modest wage, but nonetheless, the focus on it was to ensure that young people were able to kind of retain and sustain and develop professional skills, notwithstanding the fact that we were entering a period of national recession. And so what I think you'll see the Chancellor do and what I would expect is that he will probably use levers to stimulate consumer demand. In some ways, with something like Christmas on the horizon, he probably won't need to do very much when it comes to things like retail, because that sort of deals with itself um, in the Christmas period. But I do think you'll see him operating the levers when he thinks that either a demographic, for example, young people are particularly disadvantaged, or he thinks a sector needs particular support. That is very much the kind of direction 
of travel and the way that the Treasury has been thinking about support. And I, and I know that, you know, he is very keen, obviously, I mean, oh, you know, we, we just, we've just gone back into another period of furlough, but in principle, he's very keen to wean workers off that idea of furlough and to get people back into the workplace and to get things functioning. And we have had guarantees from the Prime Minister that from the 2nd of December, we're returning to the regional tiered system. And in this part of the world, I think it is a fair expectation that that means the return to tier one and all workplaces open. What I also think that the Chancellor will do is he will be, well, I know that he is approaching the point where he will want to inject some fiscal discipline. Because one of the things I've heard him say more than once is that one of the reasons why people vote Conservative is that they expect us to be responsible with the finances. And obviously there's been a huge spend this year just on the pandemic response. It's already well over 300 billion exclusively on coronavirus. So I think it's probably right to say that he will swing the axe a bit in terms of government spending. And that doesn't have any direct ramifications for business, but I think it's probably right to say that there is no department of government that can consider itself um, safe from any form of cut because it will be one way um, of securing it. And I think in time, although not now, there could be tax rises. But whenever I've heard him talk about that, one of the things I've heard him say is how much he doesn't want sort of hardworking people to be unduly penalised. And he's looking for opportunities in taxation um, in areas that he thinks haven't been sufficiently explored in the past. So um, he, I know his priority is to keep the labour market as healthy as possible until we begin some kind of recovery. And my, my feeling is that his instinct is to sort of throw his arms around working people and particularly small business owners and entrepreneurs ra rather than to clobber them with, with tax. But he has indicated a few areas where I think he is looking to make some fairly substantial savings. And what I think he'll do is he'll set a long term plan to restore fiscal discipline and some uh, and rebalance the budget. So I think those are my sort of headline thoughts. But my my best guess as to what businesses in this part of the world can expect would be interventions that were directed at people that were particularly hard hit. So I think I think he will want to reinvigorate his package for the young. And I think he will try to use levers to stimulate customer demand so that, and as I say, he will be partly assisted in that, I think, in tier one areas by Christmas, because I think people will come out onto the high street naturally. And actually, if I was giving you one other reflection, which isn't really a government reflection, it's more a sort of consumer behaviour thought. When we first locked down between March and sort of went to the beginning of July, really, um, my impression from the emails I received and my discussions with constituents were that a lot of people were living in a state of quite considerable fear of the virus. And if anything now, again, judging from the same types of conversation and emails, I think that people feel slightly differently, which is that they are more almost of the view that the virus is unlikely to pose a risk to them. There's not much of it in this part of the world. So some of the reticence that we saw in the summer months for people to get back out onto the high street, I think won't be replicated in December, because if anything, the greater difficulty has been persuading people this time that there's a, there's a need to lock down in the first place, rather than um, them having a fundamental fear for their own health and well-being. I think what he will I think what he will do, and this was very much indicated from what the Treasury officials said at the select committee today, is they will make an, a, an assessment by sector. They will look at sectoral damage, and the levers they deploy will be less about sort of direct tax breaks, but doing things that, it, that stimulate consumer demand. I would be concerned like you say Laura there'll be a natural return to the high street come the 2nd of December when we're all starting to do Christmas shopping and really think for the month of December what would concern me is where it leaves our high streets and our small independents after the Christmas period looking further ahead to January February March I think that that's a question that is uh, is a very important one. I think it probably goes beyond anything that I would expect to be legislated for by central government. 
But I think that there, there are quite serious issues around retail because the combination of a sort of once in a century global pandemic and the availability of online shopping has just affected consumer behavior. So it's not that people don't still want stuff. It's just that they found a way of doing it that's more efficient, safer, and it's going to be pretty difficult to shift them out of those habits. Now, one of the things I would say about Hungerford, which I think it shares with Marlborough, is that it's quite unique as a shopping experience. It's quite, it's quite a special town. Obviously, I think all the towns in my constituency are special, but I think you know exactly what I mean, in that there is, it is, I hate using horrible kind of language or jargon, you know, but it's, it's sort of a destination. You might come for a day to Hungerford, you might have lunch, you might, you know, it's so pretty, particularly at Christmas and so on. So I think that the survival of the um, independent shops, and I think they do have an appeal of their own, um, but I, I am aware that there are issues with rents and sort of rates that they have been raised with me. So we may need to have another discussion specifically about, about that element. Thank you, Laura. Is there any risk that the 2nd of December date will change? And if so, how much notice would we get? That is an excellent question. Um, I basically put it in those terms to the Prime Minister, actually. Um, it was pretty difficult voting for the lockdown, if, you know, as the MP for... I tend to say West Berkshire just to kind of... Because if I say Newbury, people feel offended that I'm... That is the title of the constituency, but I'll just call it West Berkshire for now. Because... I do think that people here were not satisfied that they were at sufficient risk to warrant another national lockdown. That was the, that is the headline view. I conducted a sort of survey on my website. I mean, I won't pretend that every, you know, I got, I had maybe 400 people reply to it. And it was about 57% in favor of national lockdown. So it was pretty finely balanced. And the people who've objected to it have made fair arguments. I will just spend a moment answering on the reason for the lockdown and why at this point, I'm confident that we will return to tier one. So I had a call with Jenny Harries, who is the deputy chief medical officer, sort of the day after the leak, the leaked news that an, a lockdown was in the offing. And what she said is she accepted, because it was, it was a call with Southeast MPs, she accepted that the rate of the virus was basically low in this part of the world. And in truth, it has remained low ever since we came out of lockdown in the first place, and it wasn't that high at any point. So it has basically been consistently low since July. But what she said is that the, the rate of positive tests was increasing rapidly. And the sort of shape that she was seeing of that in this part of the world suggested to her that it wouldn't be more than a matter of weeks before we would be drawing parallels with parts of the Midlands and the Northeast and so on. And one of the points she made, which I found very compelling, is she said, at the moment, all the hospitals in your part of the world, the Royal Barks, John Radcliffe, the Great Western, all of them are now offering primary and secondary care, whether that's cancer treatment or, you know, heart treatment or, um, or elective surgeries, for example, hip replacements, many of which had got backed up because they'd been postponed earlier in the year. All of that process is happening as normal. And she said, if you want to keep it going as normal, then I, you know, then my strong view would be in favour of a lockdown. And I did think that was a very important consideration because I've had some really, really moving emails about people who've had procedures and treatments delayed. And I don't think that can happen again. And I've spoken to the chief executives of both the Royal Barks and the Great Western, and they are in very good shape. They're basically, you know, because the other effect of us living in this quite quiet and restricted ways of course the ordinary winter flu is not coming with anything like the same frequency so some of the pressure that the NHS could be expected to feel at this time of year isn't really happening which means they're working through the backlog they're delivering cancer treatment someone very close to me has recently been diagnosed with cancer and they're going in for their treatment in two and a half weeks that's what you'd expect in ordinary service and that's continuing and if that if this lockdown you know preserves that then I think it's worth doing but just returning to your question, which is a very good one. There is a lot of pressure from the backbenches on the Prime Minister. You probably read it in the papers and it's true. And he knows that, it, you know, it was something of a struggle to get the, not a struggle, but quite a lot of, um, it was quite an exercise to get the votes for the lockdown. And a lot of it was conditional on coming out on the 2nd of December. He's also sent us text messages kind of confirming this. And I do think in a part of the world like this, where we're tier one, 
unless there was some you know really extraordinary event between now and the 2nd of December like some you know really overwhelming data um, I think it's almost certain that we will come out I mean I'm going on his assurance which is all I really can go on but I I fully expect that to be the case and if it isn't the case and the data is still very low then I'm going to you know it's going to be difficult for me to, to give the government my, my vote in support. I read somewhere that um, the government are talking about if if um, families have um, a big Christmas I mean you know we're, we're a family of 10 when we're all together then there's some talk that um, we'll have to isolate for two weeks after Christmas is is that a possibility? Right I mean, okay I, I mean I can give you an honest answer on that I don't think you should expect the normal Christmas to be totally honest I don't think there will be Christmas parties I don't think there will, the government will be encouraging large gatherings what I've mainly noticed about Christmas is that so far they've said nothing about it um, and that, to be honest, indicates to me that there will be an announcement, but I, I do get the mood music that they're going to make a sort of fairly qualified statement about it and probably there'll be limitations on numbers. They're definitely not going to want to sort of do a one month national lockdown with all the problems and negative consequences that entails and then undo all that work because people have a boozy Christmas weekend. And I, that's not to belittle it because I have the same thing, obviously a big family, and we always get together. But I think it is probably right to be realistic about what there will be some sort of direction and there'll probably be a limitation on numbers in truth. Can I just ask the second part of your question about the 14 day quarantine? I mean, that could be the that could be the instruction. But I think it's really important that I also tell you what, what else the prime minister is saying about the next stage. I think it would be I think if he was in the room. He would say three things are basically our weapons going into 2021. The first, I, I can't deny, you know, it, I, I'm always, you know, cautioned to say it's not a silver bullet because there's a lot that's not known about it, but the news of the vaccine is really important. Um, I think it was, as, it was as much of a surprise to the Department of Health as it was to all MPs when Pfizer published their data earlier in the week saying it was 90% plus effective. I think the government would have been willing to roll it out at less than that. And they have already bought enough doses for 15 million people. And just to put in context what that means, there are 12 and a half million people who have been formally identified by the government as extremely clinically vulnerable, either because they have a health condition or because they're elderly. And so in principle, they've already bought enough of the vaccine to inoculate all those people. And they were all identified in March, because you'll recall there was that process of food boxes and shielding sort of procedures. So although there are going to be massive logistical challenges and there are still hurdles for the vaccine to, to cross, I think it is right to say it is one limb of the next stage of the fight. And in an ideal world by Easter, they would like to have those 15 million people inoculated. Obviously, then the second part of it, which is at a, at a more advanced stage and is not in any sort of testing, is something that's already begun, which is the rollout of what are called the lateral flow rapid tests. In other words, the 15 minute tests, they've now gone to the front line. So I think every single NHS trust has been given an allocation of them. The next stop is the care homes and then they're going to be rolled out more widely to the public and they're going to have a really significant impact, partly because of the turnaround time, partly because of their ability to identify people who have the virus who may be contagious but asymptomatic. And partly because of what they're going to be able to do for the 14 day quarantine. So you're all aware, I'm sure, that if, if you have close contact with somebody who tests positive, you are then obliged by law to stay home for 14 days. What they anticipate doing with the 15 minute tests is relaxing that requirement. And instead, people who are notified they'd have close contact would take a 15 minute test every other day during the 14 day period. And if they test positive, then they go into isolation but if they don't they could continue living as normal and also the 15 minute test will be really important for um getting large gatherings back together everything from you know music gigs to weddings to all the stuff that we've missed because it will be a threshold test that people will be able to do on their way in and it'll be a way of separating people out so that's another sort of limb of the testing and then I have to concede in advance of any criticism you may have I think it's also right to say that they readily anticipate having test track and trace working much better 
by the beginning of 2021. So those three limbs, an improved track and trace system, the 15 minute tests and the vaccine are how the Prime Minister envisages going into 2021. And implicit in that is no further lockdowns and a return to a much greater degree of normality um, in the beginning. And, and just to give you, if you don't sort of trust the government, yesterday the Health Select Committee that Jeremy Hunt chairs met with uh, John Bell, who's the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford. And he said to the committee that he estimated there was a 70 to 80% chance of returning to normal life by Easter. I run a small healthcare practice uh, in Hungerford and Newbury, a private healthcare practice. Uh, you'd probably be surprised to hear that 25% uh, of our business actually comes from the events industry. Uh, for providing first aid and that type of thing, as well as to grassroots um, sports, football, rugby, all of which have been very badly impacted by what's gone on with the pandemic. Now, the things you've talked about support for industries which have been impacted and the events industry and the events in the arts industry have been very badly impacted, which has meant that the, the ability to forecast revenue forecast what's actually going to be able to be done has been severely limited is there going to be any help for all the aspects of that of that industry to be able to get them back on their feet whether it's weddings whether it's uh, cycling events whether it's running events whatever the whole industry which impacts on on us the, the second thing and this is a personal thing you were talking about uh, personal health care on a one of the things which we have found, it's been very difficult to get uh, GP, uh, GP services for chronic conditions. And that's something which, we've, which uh, I've picked up partly through my wife who has multiple cirrhosis. And I would like to understand what is the plan to get those services back up and working and available again for, for everybody. On live events and whether that includes weddings or sporting events or whatever, the 15 minute test is definitely seen as the route to that. Um, and taken in conjunction with the vaccine, but pr preliminary, primarily the tests, that is going to be seen as the, as the way to getting live events back up and running. In terms of support for the live event sector, I don't know if you were talking about sort of direct financial support. I had a round table with some live events businesses this week and most of them were satisfied with what the Chancellor was offering they were using the furlough scheme to get all of their staff you know off and they were also using the West Berkshire grant scheme for a bit of a cash injection I'm not suggesting that their situation isn't really serious but they did seem to be happy with what they were able to access for November and what they have asked me to do is to go to the department the business department basically and seek some sort of time frame as to the rollout of the 50 minute lateral test so that they can make some projections about when they can start up again. In terms of GP services, um, I have to say, Andrew, this is the first time actually that any constituent has told me that there's been a problem. Um, I know that the GPs in Newbury, Strawberry Hill and so on are running as normal, doing a lot of kind of um, FaceTime appointments and so on but actually the message that I've had loud and clear from local GPs is that they're, that they're, they're running as normal so if you have a problem with a particular practice could I ask you to email my office because I think we might have to take it up on an individual basis that shouldn't be happening of course yes thank you thank you hi um Laura can I just ask are we confident that there will be enough of these express tests available to do the kind of um, testing that we're looking at moving forward and also would it be a consideration to do these 50 minute tests to all university students before they come home for Christmas? Two very good questions. The do we have confidence? I have asked for some more specificity from the government on this and I haven't got it to be honest um, but the fact that they talk about it every time one of the ministers is at the dispatch box suggests a high degree of confidence. So okay. I, I, I would say the clues are there. It's a very good point on the students, actually. That announcement was made today. And I don't think there was a statement in the Commons where people got to ask any questions. I'd expect that to come probably in the early part of next week. But it's a, something I'll take up for you because I think it is a really, really good, sensible idea. And I'm, 
I'm almost surprised actually there wasn't anything about that in mm. the announcement today. I don't believe that there was. Certainly when I looked at it, I didn't see anything on that. So I will follow up. Thank you. Hi, could I um, ask a question about travel and um, when the restrictions on travel are like, you know, foreign holidays, etc., likely to be eased? I don't think the government have made a decision on that, to be completely honest, Jane. Um, we're still, I mean, I think at a moment of national lockdown, it's sort of crisis mode. And that tends to be a secondary decision. The only thing that I've heard recently on international travel is that the 15 minute testing regime is likely to supplant, the, again, the quarantine requirements that you have from some countries coming oh, in. Okay. But again, I haven't heard much details of that. So, I, I mean, I, I think recalling how it went in the, in the summer, when the first lockdown was eased, international travel got back up and running reasonably quickly, although people were quite nervous about flying. So I would be probably, my expectation would be that it will follow in the same way. But I, I couldn't over kind of commit on that because I actually don't know what the government's thinking and they've given no indication on this yet so far. Again, I can take it up for you, actually, if that would help. That was great. Yeah, really good. Thank you, Laura. My pleasure. Well, thank you very much. Lovely Laura. to see you all, and I hope the next time it will be face to face. Absolutely.